Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Nate Nishidora, and welcome to another webinar presented by Philips Lighting Academy. Today's webinar is titled Challenging the Light Meter, presented by Mark Ray. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Mark Ray. Let's see if we can advance to the first slide. So before I begin, uh, I want to thank uh, Nathan and all of Philips for the invitation. Um, today, I want to hopefully uh, expand your thinking a little bit about how another way that we might consider the uh, lighting design process both uh, for outdoor and indoor. Um, and again, I think that, uh, as Nathan said at the beginning, uh, a discussion at the end uh, is just a beginning. So if there are ways we can continue the dialogue after this, I'd be grateful. Uh, second thing I want to do is acknowledge my uh, colleague John Bolo um, here. Uh, he and I have worked um, on this uh, brightness problem for, um, uh, well, half a decade anyway, um, but we've uh, been interested in this for some time. And again, I think what uh, we're coming to the point now where uh, brightness uh, might indeed be a uh, design criterion that we can actually begin to engineer. Uh, therefore, the title of the talk is Engineering Brightness. So let's, uh, let's get started. So I think that um, nearly everybody in lighting is going to appreciate that uh, we think of luminance as opposed to illuminance as corresponding to um, brightness perception. Um, and uh, generally speaking that's true, that the more luminance uh, reflected off a surface, uh, the brighter it's going to appear. Formally though, we are going to weight the spectrum uh, of that optical radiation reaching the eye in terms of the photopic luminous efficiency function, which is, or V lambda, which is uh, shown here in the upper right hand curve. And again, um, 50 years ago, we even referred to it as photometric brightness because we thought that uh, that was a good way to weight the spectrum to characterize how the visual system uh, appreciated uh, changes in brightness. Now, what we'll go through today are many examples that two surfaces of equal luminance, photopic luminance, or rooms lighted the same photopic luminance, don't or only rarely would appear equally bright. Uh, and that's uh, largely because of the assumption that the photopic luminous efficiency function represents how we see quote unquote brightness. Um, now, one of the things that we've uh, come to appreciate is there are really two domains that we have to consider. One that deals with things like signal lights, which we call aperture mode. Um, if you're a pilot landing an airplane, for example, you're in an otherwise black surround. And a lot of the vision research that underlies brightness perception was done that way. And you'll see, for example, in this um, illustration, uh, a red patch and a green patch, and people are asked to uh, rate the relative brightness. The second one, which probably is more applicable to architectural lighting applications, are scenes. And so here we have a scene with a warm color temperature and a cool color temperature. And again, those will not necessarily be seen as equally bright at the same photopic uh, light levels. So let's talk first about aperture mode. So again, just to reinforce the last point, these are isolated luminous elements, so you should think of them as uh, points of light in an otherwise dark field. Again. Um, traffic signals or uh, landing lights, uh, and they're affected, as uh, we'll show in a minute, the luminance or the achromatic content, uh, and then it's also affected by the hue, that is red, green, or blue, and the saturation, and then the bottom here we see uh, different levels of saturation with the same hue being red from highly saturated to low saturated. Generally speaking, these are going to be seen as different in brightness at the same luminance. Now, the mechanisms for brightness, one of the things that people um, have demonstrated going back uh, many years is rods play almost no role uh, in brightness until you become uh, sort of a purely scotopic or very, very dim light conditions. Um, and evidence for that indirect is that the bluish violet and red lights, these saturated lights, uh, will appear brighter than, say, a white light at the same luminance. Now, if it was rods only, then the red lights would not appear brighter um, uh, necessarily because the rods are not very sensitive to long wavelengths. So it is the hue uh, and saturation as well as the achromatic content that really drives our perceptions of uh, brightness and rods uh, are not really a, an important role whatsoever in this, in this uh, discussion. 
So just to kind of give you a quick cross-section, uh, this is only to indicate that there are three uh, cone types, uh, uh, the middle, the short, and the long wavelength cones. And these are going to be the dominant photoreceptors that uh, people have believed for many, many years uh, drive brightness perception. So light comes through the pupil, is absorbed by these, photo these photoreceptors, and then the neural signals go back and exit the eye along the optic nerve. But we don't really have direct um, access to these uh, photoreceptors. Um, but nevertheless, um, when we consider the three cone types, it's really just two, the long and the middle wavelength cones, that uh, constitute V-lambda. But if you look at the spectral sensitivity of the short wavelength cones, it should become obvious uh, that the V-lambda correction, that is for luminance, is going to discount any short wavelength radiation. And that's really the key point I want to get across, is that V-lambda, as defined, uh, does not take into account the short wavelength cone, which does contribute to brightness perception. Now, it isn't the photoreceptors, as I said before, that are directly relevant, but just to remind everybody that these photoreceptors are going to be processed by bipolars and ganglion cells before they exit the brain. And there are two basic channels that we have that contribute beyond the achromatic content, that is the luminance, the red-green over here, and the uh, blue-yellow pathways. And those both combine in various ways to uh, determine how bright something is going to be. And generally speaking, a bluish um, uh, white light, if you will, or a blue light is going to appear brighter for the same um, uh, photopic luminance as something that is desaturated like yellow. Um, the red-green also participates in that, as I said before, and we take that as indirect evidence that rods don't play a significant role in the perception of brightness. Now back um, in the 70s and early 80s, there were a number of people uh, working on modeling how brightness perception is um, formed. And you start, as I said before, with the long, middle, and short wavelength cones. They are, this is the wiring diagram that comes into V lambda, which is just the L and M cone, which you saw before. The Y minus B, which is L plus M, which is yellow, minus the blue in this case and then L minus M plus S. Those get combined to produce these channel responses. Here's our friend V lambda. This is the Y minus B channel and the R minus G channel. And these form the spatial receptive fields that are going to constitute uh, color as well as acuity. So in fact, in the fovea, these are the types of uh, receptive fields that you have, very small centers and surrounds, and they are also contributing to the achromatic whereas the blue-yellow system is very coarse, has low spatial resolution, and so on. But again, from an overall brightness perception, not necessarily uh, threading a needle, this is going to play a dominant role in our perception of brightness for the same photopic level because V-lambda does not include uh, the S-cone contribution. So really the key insight is short wavelengths are going to enhance brightness for the same photopic illuminance, and there is a physiological basis uh, for that phenomenon. Now, since the uh, 70s, a number of people have tried to address the question of how bright do different lights appear. So here's the 1931 CIE diagram. Uh, here's the spectrum locus from uh, 450 nanometers coming around to 700 nanometers. Uh, the black point in the center is an equal energy spectrum, and each of these contour lines represent what's called equal brightness to luminance ratios. So for example, on this one right here, compared to an equal energy spectrum, this anything on that particular contour is going to appear 7% brighter uh, than an equal energy spectrum. And down here, the numbers can get as high as 18 to 20. So a deeply saturated blue spectrum, spectral blue, is going to be 20 times brighter, appear 20 times brighter than the luminance would otherwise uh, indicate. And there have been, as you see here, a number of people have been working on this uh, phenomenon for uh, nearly 50 years. Now, to give you a specific example, if we take a reference white, and we want to compare the brightness of a particular green, 
we will be able to calculate, once we make a match in equal brightness, how much luminance is produced here and how much luminance is produced there. So in this example, we have 10 candles per meter square of the white, but it only takes, in this case, 4.65 candles per meter squared to make the green and the white look equally bright. So the brightness luminance ratio for this particular patch of light is 2.15. Now we can plot that in the diagram uh, that we showed before. And so here's our green and you see it's on this contour right here of 2.15. So anything along there is equally bright uh, for this reference of luminance of an equal energy spectrum. For the red light we have a brightness luminance ratio of 2.93. So this particular red is seen normally three times uh, or only takes one-third the luminance roughly to equal the brightness. Now you notice and if, if you're familiar with chrome, um, color matching and uh, colorimetry I can combine the red and the green together along that line to equal a particular yellow and you'll notice that that particular yellow is on this 1.07 so it's a 7% greater brightness than the equal energy spectrum. Now Here's a demonstration we use a lot in our teaching here where you have, in the, on the left hand side, you have this spectral power distribution, this is a green LED, and on the right you have a red LED, and you can put them together and they will appear yellow as predicted by the chart I just saw. So you have physically the same green and the same red combined together. And of course, if you do that, the luminance, assuming that you have 1.5 units of the green and 1 unit of red, uh, would give you a measured luminance of the yellow of 2.5. There's nothing remarkable about that and everybody believes that to be true. But brightness is nonlinear. So if I combine that brightness of the green, the brightness of the, yellow, of the red, it does not equal as you would predict the brightness of the yellow. In fact, what you see is that either the brightness of the original green or the brightness of the original green are brighter, appear brighter than the combined, when you put the same physical energy together, the yellow will look less bright than either of its components alone. And that is predicted from uh, this diagram. So if I have uh, a brightness luminance ratio of 2.15 and I have 1.5 luminance, then I have 3.22 units of green. I do the same with the red. I get the, the one unit of, of luminance for the red the brightness luminance ratio is 2.93. So those are the two values that are over here. But when I combine it, I have 1.07 times 2.5 luminance. You'll notice that the combined is actually appears less bright than either one alone. So even though it has twice the luminance, uh, it still looks less bright. And again, that's not a, just a trick of calculation. We show that demonstration over and over again. So brightness is distinctly nonlinear. It's sub-additive, and one has to take into account the chromaticity as well as the achromatic content if one is going to predict brightness. So that's always a fun demonstration, and I encourage you, if, you, if you're handy, to put that together. It's a pretty impressive uh, demonstration showing how the visual system uh, responds differently to brightness than it does to luminance. Now, among the people that have done this, uh, there's broad agreement, but not complete agreement. As you'll see here, the predictions for a variety of blue and white uh, and green sources, uh, you'll get slightly different calculations depending on what you use. Now, remember I said it was nonlinear, and it depends a lot upon the light level you're adapted to, what's the surround, what was your previous uh, exposure, and the color contrast. All of those contribute to a very complicated uh, prediction system uh, that is not easily characterized by a linear model. But we have used this here at the Lightning Research Center to advise the Federal Aviation Administration uh, to develop um, guidelines because some of the pilots are claiming that new LEDs are seen as too bright. Now what you have here is aviation green, white, and blue and we develop these contours that tell if the chromaticity of say an incandescent filtered blue green light uh, is here, what would an LED o be over here? And you'll get about a 50% brightness enhancement, which some pilots object to. So the Federal Aviation Administration is now using this aperture mode data that we developed to begin to um, change the specifications 
uh, for runway uh, signal lights for aviation. Now let's shift gears here and move from aperture mode or signal lights to um, illuminant mode. This would again be more in line with what we do for architectural lighting. So if you take that brightness luminance ratios that we saw before, the prediction would be that high pressure sodium, because it has a hue to it, is going to be seen as 9% brighter than metal halide. As you can see here are the same data um, shown for a variety of light sources. But we began in the early 90s to make a test of that. And what we found was, and I think you all can appreciate that if you, if you walk outside, for the equal illuminance in a parking lot, high pressure sodium sources are always seen as less bright than a white or a metal halide or white LED source. So you have opposite predictions from aperture mode, that is signal lights, to what you would get for an illuminated uh, scene, uh, in this case an outdoor scene. And it's quite a big difference between high pressure sodium, in this case, and metal halide. And we've done a number of demonstrations. Here's one in Austin, Texas. Uh, we had four parking lots, so you have high pressure sodium at 19 lux. You have a fluorescent source illuminating this parking lot at 11 lux. You have a, another high pressure sodium lighted to a much lower level, and then you have uh, three lux of the fluorescent. So you have basically a two by two array, two high pressure sodium, two fluorescent, one at high level, two at high levels, and two at low. And if you now ask people how bright does it appear, what you see is that indeed, when you have a higher light level, people uh, say they rate it brighter than they would under a lower light level. Um, but you'll notice that even though there's nearly twice the amount of illuminance from the high pressure sodium, you don't get twice as brightness perception. And in fact, here at low light levels, you find that people find this to be um, less than adequate with regard to illumination, whereas the fluorescent, even though it's less illuminance, is seen as more adequate. Now we'll talk a little bit more about this, but if you ask people how safe and secure they feel, in fact, at a nominally half the illuminance, you're getting a much uh, greater sense of how safe it is to walk in that environment than it would be under high pressure sodium for both low and high. And again, low light levels are always perceived as being uh, less safe. Um, and that seems, as we'll talk later on, well correlated with people's brightness perception. In fact, what we did was we went to uh, study this in a more controlled environment. So now here what we have are two spectral power distributions, metal halide, high pressure sodium, with the hypothesis, again, thinking about V lambda is not including uh, the S cone, that higher short wavelength energy uh, should produce greater brightness. And here's a, a plot. Let me explain this a little bit. This is the metal halide illuminance relative to high pressure sodium in percent. So when it's at 100, that means that the photopic illuminance of the metal halide is equal to high pressure sodium. And when it's 200, for example, then you have twice the illuminance for metal halide uh, that you did for high pressure sodium. And at 50, you have half the illuminance uh, that you had for high pressure sodium. So 100 is equal photopic illuminance. And on this is the percentage of time that people rated um, the metal halide as brighter. So if it was um, equal in terms of perception at 100 equal illuminance, you would find half the time they say metal halide is brighter and half the time um, high pressure sodium was brighter. That is a chance. But in fact, what you see is about a 20 in this case, 21% reduction on average from three experiments saying that you can reduce the illuminance of metal halide by 21% relative to high pressure sodium and people will perceive that as equally bright. So this is an empirical result, um, one that led us then to begin to think about modeling this. How do we predict this instead of just one experiment at a time? How do we generalize this? Well, we've selected here just two examples from the literature. Uh, Wheel back in 1953 uh, did an experiment. Uh, what you do is you fixate over here. Uh, you have an adapting field, which is a 3000K adapting field. And then you have a reference source, in this case a 400, uh, 546 nanometer reference source. And then you change B up and down until you get uh, them to appear equally bright. And the results indicate, as we hypothesized and as demonstrated back in the 50s, Here's our friend V lambda. Now this is on a log scale, and so it looks a little different. But you'll, what you'll notice is this increased brightness um, 
for short wavelength radiation, as again you would expect um, to do that. And you'll notice too, just in this case, that there's slight differences um, at, uh, for the short wavelengths um, for high and low light levels, where there are no differences over here on the longer wavelength side. Now, Billy Wooten in 1975 with colleagues did a similar experiment, but this is a, a little more exotic, so be patient while I explain this. So your fixation point is here. You have a 3000K adapting field, and then what you're going to do is you're going to have what's called an increment threshold. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure how many watts, radiant watts it takes, to just detect this little one degree spot on this background. Now that's well and good because this is a very, very bright, you'll see 17,000 candles per meter squared, really super bright, and it takes a, an increment higher of this particular, of these wavelengths to, to see that. Now what we know from basic physiology is if you now extinguish this light and you measure dark adaptation, your eye is still gradually readapting to a new light level, but yet you present this increment threshold on that. And that way we can see how sensitive the eye is to all of these wavelengths at different um, times of dark adaptation, but also different um, uh, equivalent adaptation levels, as if we drop from 17 down to 10, down to 5, down to 2, and so on. So this is an increment threshold on a steady light at 17,000. We're going to measure um, how much the relative sensitivity, wavelength by wavelength, but then we're going to extinguish the light to simulate different adaptation levels. That's the experiment. And what you see is, again, here's V lambda, this red curve on a log axis, and again, for the long wavelength side, you get very similar results and well characterized by V lambda. But what you'll notice is at time zero, this is when you're looking at a steady light, great enhancement of short wavelength, but 30 seconds later and 180 seconds later, that is equivalent lower adaptation levels, the relative contribution of the short wavelength uh, becomes less and less. So not only do you have um, enhanced sensitivity in short wavelengths, but you also have a change in that enhancement depending upon what light level it is. So at high light levels, S cones play a much more dominant role than they do at low light levels. Now, if you plot this uh, function called G, which is going to weight my S cone sensitivity, and you plot that as a function of equivalent adaptation level, you get a nice straight line and if you use that V lambda plus this value of G, S cone, you, these are the Wooten data that we just showed you, now fitted with this very simple model. Now, to check that, we were looking in this particular experiment at outdoor lighting levels, so we chose this range of light levels representing what you might get in an outdoor parking lot. And from that, we're able to generate new luminous efficiency functions, if you will, uh, for if each light level. Now, when I say luminous efficiency, that implies an additive linear system, which of course this is not. But the point being that you see this enhanced short wavelength, this is V lambda, and it gets larger. The higher the light level, the relative contribution of the short wavelength increases. So this then became our model to try to predict um, uh, brightness perception in a parking lot application. And what we see is that simple model, if you now take all of these sources and you look at the rated relative brightness, what you get is this nice linear relationship for all kinds of light sources. So the model seems to be pretty good at both uh, high and low light levels. However, you see a slight discrepancy here, best fitting curve, but still well characterized um, by this simple model uh, for practical light sources that we're going to be exposed to in architectural lighting outdoors. Now, in 2011, um, Photius and Scheele presented, uh, took our data and showed that, in fact, that it wasn't a very good fit at this light level. It's not bad over here uh, because what they did is they weighted this by scotopic-photopic ratio. Now, I've made the point several times that rods can't play a role in brightness perception, but empirically what you find is that taking into account the rod contribution, the data were better fit than they were by our model where we had S cones and so on. Now we knew that this physiologically uh, wasn't correct, but 
what was it became the question that became the reason why those data, which were perfectly valid, were not well predicted by our model. Now, here we show before, we have our S cone, L cone, M cone, and this is sort of your conventional thinking. You have three cones that contribute to it, and I showed you the model uh, where all three cones go through bipolars. You have a Y minus B and a R minus G channel, and this has been the conventional wisdom. But recently, there's been a new photoreceptor, the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell, that has a sensitivity that looks very close to actually where Rod's spectral sensitivity are. But it's a very, very different um, uh, neurophysiology. This is in the ganglion cell layer instead of the receptor level. Uh, and we've known that this contributes to um, circadian rhythms uh, for some time now. Now here's a very, I think, a very interesting and important uh, graph from uh, Samar Hattar's group. Um, and what they're showing is that there are not just these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that contribute to circadian rhythms, which is shown here, the suprachiasmatic nuclear, the side of the biological clock. But there's another group that contributes to uh, the olivary pretechnal nucleus, which controls pupil size, and then there are ones that contribute to the visual system as well. And he's found a new type that he isn't quite sure where it goes, but that is work that indicates that there isn't just one intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell that drives circadian rhythms in combination with rods and cones, but there's ones that contribute to the visual system as well. So we have to begin to think about how do we begin to remodel our conventional wisdom about how this uh, red-green system, uh, red-green-blue system contributes to brightness perception. We need to begin to think about does this intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell also participate? And what I'm going to show you is it probably does. So these are the same data now that we had before, but now modeled with this um, intrinsically photosensitive photopigment, melanopsin, that contributes to it. And you'll notice that the data with this model now lines up nicely, as does the Photius data. So it seems that it's, it's the long, middle, short wavelength cones that contribute in conjunction with ret the intrinsically photo photosensitive retinal ganglion cells to be able to predict brightness, at least for the experiments we've done before. Now this has actually been taken up, um, this um, indicates, this is a roadway illumination uh, project done by Audi. Uh, that gives you whether you have a halogen headlight or you have an LED headlight and the blue, light blue, is what's observed and the dark blue is our model predictions and you'll see that they're in the right direction, they could probably be a little more precise but again it's difficult to get you know what is the uh, brightness of a headlight on the ground ahead of you but nevertheless it does seem to be able to make predictions in the right direction um, so we're seeing now a convergence where this particular photoreceptor needs to be included into our consideration of brightness perception. So that's all well and good and that sounds all very interesting, but in the end, what does anybody care about it from an architectural lighting point of view? Well, one of the constructs that we've developed is that actually people uh, care about value. They don't just care about the lowest price, but they want to maximize their benefit at the lowest cost. And so I hope you're convinced that lumens is not the benefit that we're trying to deliver in lighting. Uh, and yet that seems to drive a lot about what we do. You, you meet a prescribed illuminance level, and then of course the value engineering then becomes how do I get the cost out of that. But if you're trying to do something other than V lambda, in this case the purpose, of this, the purpose of this talk is to talk about engineering brightness. If the benefit is brightness, then lumens is not a good way to characterize uh, the benefit that you're trying to get in, say, a parking lot. So in personal security it is an important one for outdoor, but I want to just make it clear that driving safety, health and well-being, uh, color perception and productivity are all the benefits that people care about. What we're going to talk about is this idea of personal security because people really don't care directly about brightness. They just want to feel safe and secure when they, when they go outdoors. So 
Here's a study we did um, fairly recently, in which again we go back to our friends, high pressure sodium and um, metal halide. And here's V lambda. And this is how we're going to measure traditionally the light levels. And this is the spectral weighting function that develops out of the model. So what you see is this enhanced sensitivity to short wavelengths. And what we're going to see is, does this predict in any way uh, personal security, not just brightness? Well, here's the graph you already saw, uh, in which we have, in this case, high pressure sodium, metal halide. Here's our 79% as judged as equally bright. And here is the kind of situation you have, but when you ask people how safe and secure you find, you get a fairly strong correlation between people's perceptions of brightness as opposed to illuminance and people's perceptions of personal security. So we think that in a parking lot application that we should begin to think about designing or engineering light according to a spectral luminous efficiency function that represents brightness rather than illuminance. And that has implications not only for feeling safe and secure, but things like light pollution, uh, energy efficiency, and so on. But the point is you can now use an alternative spectral weighting function uh, to begin to design your outdoor lighting applications. Now, I've spent uh, most of the time talking up to this point uh, simply because the funding has been there for us to research that. Um, but the question is, what about brightness in more interior outdoor light levels? Well, we've uh, tried to address that. Uh, here's our original curve, um, the modeling, and here's the G function with now the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell added to that. And we've actually done a number of experiments to show that in that gap between the very highest and the lowest from, um, from Wooten, in fact, fits in relatively nicely along that straight line. So we have added confidence that this line represents how the S cone or the B minus Y channel is going to change its relative gain with light level. Again, higher light levels means you have a greater relative sensitivity of short wavelength than at low light levels. Whoops. Sorry about that. So this is uh, literally hot off the press. Uh, I had a student do that this semester, so I'm going to show you uh, results that no one has seen before uh, dealing with the indoor application. So this is in our laboratory. Uh, subjects come, they, look, have a, they put their chin in a chin rest here, and then you have a scale model of a, in this case, a living room. Um, illuminated uniformly up here as a, as a nice diffuser so the uniformity within this space is I think uh, within um, 10 percent so from corner to corner so it's a nice uniform distribution well controlled uh, and subjects come and they make ratings of brightness in this particular setup. So here's um, the experimental design. Uh, you have a warm source 2700K, you have a cool source, you have a low light level, and you have a high light level. Now I want to point out that the reflectance of the walls is 70% in this particular case. All right, Good. And here are the results of the brightness rating. So here's 100 lux, 350 lux, and the 2700K, as you'll no doubt be unsurprised, uh, is always rated a lower brightness, statistically lower, than the 6500K. So this upper curve represents the brightness perception for the 6500K and the lower one represents 2700K. Obviously when you increase from 100 to 350 you're going to increase your brightness perception but as I said you're always going to get this offset in terms of cooler sources for the same illuminance are going to look brighter. Now here is the model predictions this brightness Lux, as we're going to call it, replotted the same data, now plotted as a function of brightness as calculated uh, by our model using the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell plus all the LM and S cones. And you'll see it's a very nice fit. Now, what happens if you go to a lower reflectance? So again, warm and cool, hot, low and high light levels, but now we have a lower uh, wall reflectance. Again, you get an offset based upon light level. Increasing the light level increases brightness and increasing the short wavelength contribution increases brightness perception as well. And again, once you do the model calculation, you get this very nice linear relationship between 
um, a semi-logarithmic relationship between calculated uh, brightness lux as a, um, and it's a function of uh, brightness perception. So we believe then that this model not only applies well to outdoor applications, uh, but these are the first experiments uh, that we've done showing that this model also seems applicable to designing for brightness uh, in interior spaces as well. Now, this is the summary, and I, I should be able to finish a little early so that we can uh, discuss the, um, the presentation as you wish. Um, so I want to, first of all, talk about aperture mode, and I think it's important that you remember that aperture mode or signal lights has a very different physiology uh, than illuminant mode. But brightness of a relatively small patch is not predicted by its luminance. You need to know the hue and the saturation um, if you're going to predict brightness. Um, models show qualitatively similar trends. All the models that have been done for the last 30, 40 years show that. Uh, but because it's a nonlinear system, the differences are related to you know, what your starting conditions, uh, what other uh, lights are in the field, and that sort of thing. But it is useful and has been useful, uh, at least for uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, they're finding good results from the models that we've developed to be able to predict the relative brightness for sources. Once you know their chromaticity and their intensity, you can be able to adjust their brightness so that uh, the pilots see them as more uniform. But it is not predictive for architectural applications where you're trying to illuminate an interior. So we have the illuminant mode, and I think that what's relatively new, and maybe uh, new to you, is that the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that include melanopsin appear to be needed to include for an accurate model. You do pretty good just by taking into account the three cones, but if you get very um, uh, discrete light sources, as you would with LEDs, that is spectrally discrete, um, it reveals the need for intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Uh, but rods are not playing a role in this, although they mimic the spectral sensitivity of those cells, they do not play a role in brightness perception. Um, so we do a pretty good job of predicting for brightness for outdoor applications. We've done a number of re, um, empirical research. The model seems to be pretty good. Uh, but for outdoor applications, I think the important takeaway is that brightness perception, rather than illuminance, uh, is a greater predictor of people's sense of security. Now remember, we're going from brightness perception to people feeling safe and secure in a parking lot. And that, I believe, delivers the benefit often that you're trying to do in a parking lot. Rarely are you going to try to thread a needle in a parking lot, um, but walking into a parking lot and feeling safe and secure, I think, is an important design consideration for outdoor applications, many. It also appears from this data that we've just collected that it does a very good job of predicting brightness in indoor applications as well. So again, in circulation spaces, relaxation spaces, and so on, this might be a tool to use. Uh, it's certainly not the only one, uh, depending on cultures, people may or may not like cool sources in indoor applications, but at least it's a way of engineering this particular um, design objective. If brightness is what you're trying to deliver, you're able to be able to predict that and engineer it um, as well. So I uh, thank you for your attention. I hope uh, the pace was okay. I want to be sure I allowed enough time for discussion, but... Uh, um, myself and my colleague John Bolo, thank you for uh, for your attention. <laughs>